Um, I have, uh, you know, mixed emotions about the opportunity to be here because I, these conversations are of immense personal interest. Uh, I do teach about, I, I'm a historian of Christianity and science, that, that combination. And uh, I haven't previously connected with uh, the group here. And I think in general, historians of science, philosophers of science, but especially historians of science, uh, in, in, in people in my world, almost never connect with, with people in your world. And, and um, I don't think that's a good thing, so I'm very glad to be here. I, I am reminded, however, of, a, of an interesting individual in the circumstances leading to my being here. For those of you who are a Boston Red Sox fans, if you, if you remember the name Carol, C-A-R-R-O-L-L, -L, Carol Hardy, probably no one does, right? No one remembers him except for one fact. He's the only man ever to pinch hit for Ted Williams. <laughs> he also later pinch hit, served as a pinch hitter for Carl Yastrzemski and Roger Maris. <laughs> and yet, who was Carol Hardy, right? Okay, so anyway, I'm pinch hitting for David Livingston. <clears throat> and David wrote a splendid book on um, pre-Adamite pre humans and the whole long story of that, going all the way back to the late 17th century with Isaac Le Perrier, and then coming down into the 21st century almost. Um, I recommend that book. I, I can't pinch hit for David by, by telling you the details of his book. Um, my story will intersect with Adam and Eve a little, uh, intentionally, um, but it's primarily a different story. It's about the story of the American evangelical encounter with natural history, which sets up a lot of these things. Now, I'm going to be reading a lot of quotes. Some of them are really long. I don't I have to keep having to say quote, unquote, so I'm not going to do that. Once in a while, I'll go like that when I'm quoting. Um, and you will see if you, sometimes the slides will be, I hope, helpful to you. You may want to look at them more than you look at me. But let me begin my story. One hot July morning in the first year of the 19th century, the missionary-minded evangelical president of Yale College, Timothy Dwight, happened upon one of his tutors, Benjamin Silliman, under the shade of the grand trees in the street in front of the college buildings. Nearing completion of a law degree, Silliman was considering an offer to preside over an academy in Georgia. Dwight had other plans. He thought the 22-year-old scholar would be the ideal person to become Yale's first professor of natural history. Dwight needed a strongly committed evangelical to teach this new field, rapidly growing in popularity. Natural history was all the rage in the early 19th century. As geologists unearthed previously unknown creatures of enormous size, questions about the past and future of humanity inevitably arose eliciting fascination, excitement, even awe, but also not a little anxiety. We get a sense of its emotional impact from this engaging, even romantic passage from the geology textbook used at Yale in the 1830s, written by the English Unitarian Robert Bakewell. Geology discovers to us proofs of the awful revolutions which have in former ages changed the surface of the globe and overwhelmed its inhabitants. It reveals to us the forms of strange and unknown animals and unfolds the might and skill of creative energy displayed in the ancient world. Indeed, there is no science which presents objects that so powerfully excite our admiration and astonishment. We are led almost irresistibly to speculate on the past and future condition of our planet and on man, its present inhabitant. What various reflections crowd upon the mind if we carry back our thoughts to the time when the surface of our globe was agitated by conflicting elements, or to the succeeding intervals of repose, when enormous crocodilian animals scoured the surface of the deep or darted through the air for their prey? Or, again, to the state of the ancient continents when the deep silence of nature was broken by the bellowings of the mammoth and the mastodon, who stalked the lords of the former world and perished in the last grand revolution that preceded the creation of man. Even then, for some Christians, 
The nascent field of geology was an enfant terrible, an obstreperous child shrilly shouting insults in the faces of Christians. Geologists had recently discovered deep time, the idea of a pre-human earth history of inconceivable duration, to borrow the words of Martin, historian Martin Rudwick, who is incidentally a fellow of the Royal Geological Society before he became a historian and a devout Christian believer. Increasingly, it became clear that rock layers linked with specific types of fossils all over the world could not have been produced suddenly in a single flood during human history, but must have formed over long eras by diverse geological agents, largely or entirely before the creation of humans. This directly challenged both the traditional interpretation of the Bible, that the earth is only five days older than Adam and Eve, and the common belief that Noah's flood produced the fossiliferous rocks. As Amherst geologist Edward Hitchcock noted in 1840, the claim that the earth must have existed more than 6,000 years gave rise to the prevailing opinion that geologists in general have been hostile to the Bible, an opinion which may be refuted by an appeal to their writings. No defender of the faith was more vocal in criticizing geologists than Samuel Miller, a prominent Presbyterian minister from New York who became the second professor hired by Princeton Theological Seminary. On the first day of the 19th century, Miller preached a sermon reflecting critically upon the century just completed. A greatly expanded version of more than a thousand pages was published three years later ironically called a brief retrospect of the 18th century, <laughs> in which he described the era as the age of infidel philosophy. Extracting words out of context from 1 Timothy 6.20, Miller observed that one finds in every age profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Geology was the target of his, of his tirade. Never before, he said, have there been so many deliberate and systematic attacks on revealed religion through the medium of pretended science, which was pushed to an atheistical length by some who assumed the name and gloried in the character of philosophers. Philosophers was their word for scientist. The word scientist wasn't coined until the 1830s. Natural history, in particular, he said, has been pursued with unwearied diligence to find evidence which should militate against the information conveyed in the scriptures. By contrast, he said, every sober and well-directed inquiry into the natural history of man and of the globe we inhabit has been found to corroborate the mosaic account of creation, the fall, the deluge, the dispersion, and other important events recorded in the sacred volume. In short, false science contradicted the traditional interpretation of Genesis, while genuine science confirmed it. Note that some fundamentalists in the 1920s who had no objection to geological ages, and frankly, in terms of their leadership, flat none of them did, um, those folks applied the same Pauline words to biological evolution, as you see here in this cartoon uh, by E.J. Pace, the great cartoonist of the period. Um, this, this practice was continued by certain contemporary creationists, including John MacArthur. All some creationist websites do call this out as an inappropriate eisegesis. Now, Silliman's appointment proved astonishingly successful. He helped educate many eminent scientists of the next two generations, including his son-in-law, James Dwight Dana, arguably the most important American geologist of the 19th century. He founded the American Journal of Arts and the Sciences and did as much as anyone else to organize the community of scientists in the United States. In the latter part of his career, he traveled broadly around the nation, making him well-known among ordinary Americans, while bringing them a comforting, pious message about science. Admiring as we do, the perfection of science exhibited continually by the lecturer, commented a Boston reporter in 1843, we have yet a higher love and reverence for that beautiful exhibition of divine truth to which Mr. Silliman constantly alludes, 
as seen in the wonderful works which he has successfully presented as designed by the almighty power and made known to man by human intelligence. This is the source of our respect for this accomplished professor, in comparison with which our admiration for his scientific attainments sinks into insignificance. The term progressive creation, exactly that term, associated in the 1950s with Bernard Ram and today with Hugh Ross, entered the American conversation about origins in 1829 when Silliman published his geology lectures. Speaking about the universal primitive ocean that once covered the whole earth, he noted that its retreat was gradual and proceeded in such a manner as to be consistent with the due arrangement of the earth's crust and surface and with the progressive creation, life, death, and sepulture, that is fossilization, of animals and plants. The creation of the vegetable and animal races, and there again races, the default meaning of the word race in these contexts in the 19th century is almost always species of plants and animals, and that's what it is in this context. The creation of the vegetable and animal races appears to have gone on progressively with the deposition of mineral strata and masses. It is impossible to form any other inference if we examine the contents of the terrene crust. The only point that admits of discussion is as to the amount of the time employed. Such a theory, he said elsewhere, was the only one consistent with the facts. His textbook contained, excuse me, his, um, his section of this textbook contained a table of coincidences between the order of events as described in Genesis and that unfolded by geological investigation that Silliman borrowed from Edinburgh geologist Robert Jameson. This table summarized the details of his scheme. Now, the, the full table fills a page and a, and a third, roughly. Um, I can't show all of it here in a, in a font that you would be able to read uh, from where you're sitting. But you can see the scheme in general from this opening section of it. On the left-hand column, he has Genesis. And the only part of Genesis he directly quotes is the first two verses. The rest is paraphrased all the way down. And then in the right-hand column, he puts quotations from geological authorities from the early 19th century that seem to corroborate what is happening. In this context, where you see the first two verses in Genesis referring to the watery chaos before the, first six, before the six days come and before the creation of various kinds of life, he sees this as corroborated by the observation from the leading paleontological textbook of his day by the Frenchman Georges Cuvier, whom you see on the right where you can see it's quoted. It's impossible to deny that the waters of the sea have formerly and for a long time covered those masses of matter which now constitute our highest mountains. That for him is a proof, if you will, of the historicity of the order of events in Genesis 1. Overall, Silliman presented what we now call the day-age view, defending it with some of the same hermeneutical arguments still in use today. Silliman's overall attitude merits closer attention. He admitted, quote, that Moses himself probably understood the word day according to the popular significance as an ordinary day. And he regarded the literal and obvious meaning as certainly the most obvious one to every mind not informed as to the geological structure of the globe. However, Silliman said, this proves nothing because the truths of astronomy are in exactly the same situation. Until modern astronomy arose, he said, no one entertained a doubt that the Earth is an extended plane, that it stands on a firm foundation, even on pillars, and that around it, as a center, the sun and starry heavens and azure canopy, as a solid, palpable firmament, revolve, while the waters of the heavens descend through its windows, says Silliman. Thus, Silliman drew a deliberate comparison to the reception of Copernican astronomy. Hardly two centuries have passed since the astronomy of Galileo, Kepler, and Newton was regarded as inconsistent with the scriptures and therefore heretical, he noted. 
The discrepancy of the literal meaning of the Bible with the real truths of astronomy is still as great as ever, he said. But no one any longer hesitates to regard astronomy as giving just a, a, a just view of the stupendous mechanism of the heavens. Indeed, all agree in understanding the language of scriptures as being adapted to the appearances of the heavens, which is all that humans can know, and with which alone the scriptures are concerned. The Bible was designed as a code of moral instruction and to reveal a future life, but it contained no systems of science, only incidental references to natural phenomena. Nevertheless, he concluded, geological evidence that supports the history of the flood is most abundant and altogether satisfactory, a conclusion that inspired his friend Thomas Cole the great landscape painter, to paint this picture, the subsiding of the waters of the deluge in 1829. In fact, you'll notice in this painting that over here, uh, for example, you see the ark uh, floating in the water, and you see the dove having been released, flying, and you see a human skull down here, and on the geological side, most importantly, you see an erratic boulder up here. An erratic boulder is a term that geologists use to what we now understand to be uh, detritus from a glacier, basically. It's left behind when the glacier recedes. But Silliman believed it was left behind by the flood. And, and so did a number of early 19th century geologists believe that. It wasn't until Agassiz's uh, theory of ice ages was accepted much later in the century that people had a new way of understanding um, erratic boulders. Well, what about humans? Well, addressing a scientific audience in 1842, Silliman said, the chronology of the scriptures is in strictness applied only to the history of our race, the sole moral beings whom God has placed in this world. Notably, as I already pointed out, French paleontologist Georges Cuvier had shown that no human fossils were contemporaneous with those of the extinct mammals. In his lectures, Silliman presented this as further evidence that humans must be of recent origin. So at the end of his table, you see the part on the creation of man, verses 26 and 27. He quotes Cuvier, no human remains among extraneous fossils. Um, that's a very significant point at the time. Uh, as Silliman as says in that, in that uh, appendix with his lectures, he says, man and his works appear only in the last stages of the fossil record, associated with just such beings as now exist, both in the animal and vegetable world. He's saying those were always found with animals and plants that are still around when we're fossilized, whereas that's not true of the other animals that we know about. They're found, they're extinct, and they're found with other extinct animals. Thus, he had no scientific reason to extend human antiquity beyond the traditional 6,000 years. That would happen mainly in the latter part of the 19th century after his death. Now, Silliman's student, Edward Hitchcock, a great collector of dinosaur tracks, who wrote the first textbook by a professional American, American geologist, likewise held that the traditional date for Adam and Eve um, was, was, was correct, but he combined that with an ancient earth. For both exegetical and scientific reasons, however, he preferred what's now called the gap theory to his teacher's day age view. In his opinion, Moses does not describe the fossil, but only the existing races of animals and plants. So there is no necessity for an extension of his demiurgic days into long periods in order to reconcile his account with geology. Instead, Hitchcock endorsed what he described as the theory of interpretation, which is now the most extensively adopted among geologists, according to which Moses merely states that God created the world in the beginning, without fixing the date of that beginning, passing in silence over an unknown period of its history, during which the extinct animals and plants existed. Thus, Moses described only the present creation, which took place in six literal days, less than 6,000 years ago, says Hitchcock. Hitchcock defended that view at length, finding it sufficient entirely 
to reconcile the scriptural and geological accounts because during that period, all the fossiliferous rocks except the top layer might have been formed. Now Hitchcock's favorite interpretation had been held by several influential authors since the early 19th century, including the Scottish theologian Thomas Chalmers, Oxford geologist William Buckland, and Oxford biblical scholar E.B. Pusey. Similar ideas had been advanced two centuries earlier by Dutch theologian Simon Episcopius. The gap theory, as we now call it, became very popular among conservative Protestants in the latter part of the 19th century, even more so in the first half of the 20th, when C.I. Schofield officially endorsed it in his heavily annotated version of the Bible before the Great War. You see, for example, the opening page of my grandmother's copy of the Schofield Bible, her copy printed in the 1940s, but as I understand it, the notes had been pretty much the same since one of the earlier editions, not quite the first, but one of the earliest editions, where you see the original creation, the heading under chapter one, and then right under verse one, the earth made waste by, and empty by judgment, and then the new beginning right before verse three, et cetera. And the footnotes, of course, that go with this spell all this out. Now, from the same time period as Schofield, Reuben Torrey, dean of the faculty at Biola, and an editor of the Fundamentals took the same approach. Unlike Hitchcock, Torrey included in his version a, quote, pre-Adamic race whose sin had caused the original creation to be plunged into chaos before being refitted into the abode of the present race that inhabits it, the Adamic race. Torrey's pre-Adamic race were apparently not biological ancestors of the Adamic race, from whom all people today are descended, but they were still very much like us, since Tories speculated that they may have built some of the monuments in the ancient Near East and may have survived long enough to be contemporaneous with the Adamic race. Indeed, Tory said, they may have been, forgive my pronunciations, I'm not a biblical scholar, they may have been the Rephaim and Zamzumen and the Enim mentioned in Genesis and Deuteronomy connecting them with giants in the land, as other commentators over, over the years have done with the Nephilim of Genesis chapter 6. To be sure, Tory regarded the hints in those passages as somewhat obscure, he said, and he did not claim that they had interbred. He did not claim they had interbred with the descendants of Adam and Eve, as some have suggested. On a related matter, he concluded decisively that Cain married one of the many daughters of Adam and Eve, the very position defended today by Ken Ham. Now, antebellum evangelicals did not believe in pre-Adamite humans, to the best of my knowledge. I say antebellum evangelicals. Other people out there did, um, but they did not, as far as I can tell, if they had ever even heard of them. Nor did they embellish their versions of the gap theory with references to prophetic biblical texts about the fall of Satan and the angels to account for the destruction of the original creation before the onset of the six days. Those exegetical moves apparently resulted from the influence of two evangelical authors from across the pond. One was Isabel Duncan, wife of a widely respected Scottish minister whose anonymously published 1860 book, The Pre-Adamite Man, postulated sinful humans before the Garden of Eden. Their fall led to the destruction of their world, yet they left no bones for their resurrected bodies became the angelic host. The other uh, uh, British authority was George Herkins Pember, a Cambridge-trained classicist who became a Christian and joined the Plymouth Brethren, a denomination strongly committed to dispensationalism, the system of theology originated by John Darby and later codified in the Schofield Bible. In 1876, Pember wrote Earth's earliest ages in order, quote, to remove some of the geological and other difficulties usually associated with the commencing chapters of Genesis, as he said. Since, he said, the fossil remains are those of creatures anterior to, that is prior to Adam, and yet show evident tokens of disease, death, and mutual destruction. They must have belonged to another world a sin-stained history of their own. 
Therefore, he said, we should naturally conclude that superior beings inhabited and ruled that former world and, like Adam, transgressed the laws of their creator. If so, he said, how could we account for the absence in the fossiliferous strata of any vestige of pre-Adamite men? In other words, okay, if they existed, where's their fossils? That question. Pember speculated that death did not touch those primeval men until the final destruction before Adam, and that their bodies were resolved into primal elements instead of decaying in the normal fashion. Indeed, he thought, demons might be the spirits of those who trod this earth in the flesh before the ruin described in the second verse of Genesis. Baptist theologian Bernard Ram, the leading post-war evangelical expert on science and the Bible, observed that Pember's book canonized his term, the gap theory, for it became one of the core books which has shaped modern fundamentalism. Self-educated evangelist Harry Rimmer, whom Ram has described as fundamentalism's outstanding spokesman in matters of Bible and science till the time of his death in 1952, I would affirm that, I've, I've done a lot of work on Rimmer, also advocated the gap theory as he crisscrossed the nation, speaking at thousands of public events. But he never endorsed people before Adam. Ram saw no value in the gap theory. In, in, uh, Ram, not Rimmer, Ram saw no value in the gap theory and hesitated to agree with those who asserted, and he puts this in italics, a difference between fossil man and biblical man. Ram didn't, didn't like that, including the idea that fossil man is subhuman or prehuman or some theory of pre-atomism. In Ram's view, there are problems with this theory before it can be a good option. It seems too much like having our cake and eating it, he said. Likewise, Ram rejected as pious fiction the old belief that Noah had a black son, a brown son, and a white son. The derivation of the Negro from Ham, he added, is indefensible linguistically and anthropologically. The justification of slavery from Genesis 9, 25 to 27 is one of the unhappiest examples of improper exegesis in the history of interpretation, so said Ram. However, Ram thought that a localized paradisiacal Garden of Eden made the most sense of scientific information. Outside of the garden, he said, were death, disease, weeds, thistles, carnivores, deadly serpents, and intemperate weather. To think otherwise is to run counter to an immense avalanche of fact, said Ram. Now the avalanche of fact to which Ram alluded had already fallen well before the Civil War. When natural historians accepted the Earth's great antiquity, Hitchcock pointed out in 1840, they necessarily admitted that violent and painful death was in the world before the fall of man. The running head across the top of that page in the first edition of his textbook, as you can see, Death Before the Fall, was terminology that had only just come into general use. He apparently borrowed it from what he described as an able and most interesting work, published earlier the same year, on the relation between the Holy Scriptures and some of geological science by English Congregationalist divine John Pye Smith, a tutor at Homerton College near London and the first nonconformist fellow of the Royal Society. As Hitchcock realized, the general interpretation of the Bible has been that until the fall of man, death did not exist in the world, even among inferior animals. But, he said, Geology teaches us that myriads of animals lived and, um, lived and died before the creation of man. Now for Ken Ham and every other young earth creationist I could name, the Bible clearly teaches that vertebrate animals did not suffer or die prior to the fall. In my opinion, this belief is crucial to their insistence on a young earth for the acceptance of long geological ages, as Hitchcock noted, entails that the creatures now entombed in the fossiliferous rocks predated the creation of humans. 
According to a very recent study published just two months ago uh, by John Garvey, however, the young earth creationist view of animal death had actually been rejected by most theologians prior to the Reformation, including Augustine and Aquinas, before becoming the standard Protestant view, such that John Martin Luther and John Calvin found it in Genesis 3, and John Wesley endorsed it in a sermon on the general deliverance. So given his Protestant faith, it is not surprising that what Hitchcock, uh, Hitchcock's plausible reconciliation, as he said, said uh, proposed the traditional link between human sin and animal suffering. He found what he needed in divine foreknowledge. God foresaw the fall and planned accordingly before creating the world. He presented this view for the first time in the 1847 edition of Elementary Geology, which was at that point the most widely used geology textbook in the United States. First, he stressed the plain biological facts. Not only geology, he said, but zoology and comparative anatomy teach us that death among the inferior animals did not result from the fall of man, but from the original constitution given them by their creator. One large class of animals, the carnivores, have organs expressly uh, intended for destroying other classes for food. So he says, in short, death could not be excluded from the world without an entire change in the constitution and course of nature. And such a change we have no reason to suppose from the Mosaic account took place when man fell. Next, he offered an incisive argument from scripture. When God threatened Adam and Eve with death for disobedience, the Bible, he said, seems to imply a knowledge on his part of what death was. That is, he had seen it among the inferior animals. For it would be a strange legislation that imposed a penalty of which those under the law could form no idea, he said. He also dealt with the two biblical texts that he saw most pertinent to the received view, Romans 5.12, and 1 Corinthians 15, 21. The first text in Romans showed not that death passed upon all animals, but upon all men. And because all had sinned, an act of which the inferior animals, destitute of moral natures, are not capable. And the second text, he said, was limited to the human race by its reference to the resurrection of the dead. So he concluded this, that God, in view of the certainty of man's transgressions, adapted the world beforehand to a fallen creature who must die. Death then was introduced to the world as a prospective result of man's apostasy. In other words, God had foreseen the fall and planned accordingly, creating a world in which animal death preceded the fall chronologically but not theologically. If God in his foreknowledge had known that Adam and Eve would not sin, the creation would have been different. Hitchcock's novel solution was never widely adopted, but 10 years ago, intelligent design theorist William Dembski updated it in his book, The End of Christianity. Many other conservative Protestant writers since Hitchcock have accepted an ancient earth while offering other solutions to the problem of death before the fall. Hitchcock fully realized there are no easy answers to questions posed by natural history to theodicy. A few pages earlier, he offered volcanic activity as one of, quote, many peculiar proofs of the benevolence of the deity because it actually allows internal heat to vent less violently, preventing it from rending the whole continent in pieces while raising continents from the oceans and forming valleys where many creatures thrive. He then stated an obvious objection. Should not a good and powerful God secure to his creatures the benefits which result from volcanic agency without the attendant evils, such as the destruction of property and life? The answer is crucial for understanding not only Hitchcock, but also the whole enterprise of Christian apologetics. This is a question that meets the student of natural theology at almost every step of his progress. For we find almost universally that evils are incident to operations whose natural tendency and general effect are beneficial. Probably it is so, because a greater amount of good can thereby secure, be secured in the end. But the existence of evil is one of those difficult subjects 
whose complete elucidation ought not to be expected in this world, he advised. Now these thoughts remind us that Hitchcock was arguably the leading American natural theologian of his generation. His most complete statement appeared at the height of his career in 1851, the religion of geology and its connected sciences, which offered a compelling vision of the patient work of a providential God amidst the eons of Earth history. He, see, Hitchcock said that geology opens a vast, a vista in, indefinitely backward into the hoary past, and it is gratifying to witness the same unity of design pervading all preceding periods of the world's history, linking the whole into one mighty scheme worthy its infinite contriver. How much also does this science enlarge our conceptions of the plans and operations of Jehovah? We had been accustomed to limit our views of the creative agency of God to the few thousand years of man's existence and to anticipate the destruction of the material universe a few thousand years more. But geology makes the period of man's existence on the globe only one short link of a chain of revolutions which preceded his existence and which is, reaches forward immeasurably far into the future. We see the same matter in the hands of infinite wisdom and by means of the great conservative principle of chemical change, passing through a multitude of stupendous revolutions, sustaining countless and varied forms of organic life, and presenting an almost illimit illimitable panorama of the plans of an infinite God. For Hitchcock, the progressive creation of the earth also produced beauty, as the artwork of his wife, Ora Hitchcock, so aptly shows. Their corner of the world, the Connecticut River Valley, abounds in natural beauty. He not only reveled in it, he historicized it geologically, while finding much grist for the mill of the natural theologian. In 1830, the Massachusetts legislature commissioned Hitchcock to conduct a geological survey of the state that was published in several pieces, the first such work in the United States. Listen to this passage from his initial report, where he joined beauty, geology, and theology in rapturous praise to the creator. It is certainly an interesting thought that this delightful valley, which now forms so charming a residence for man, once constituted, and for an immense period, the bottom of a tropical ocean, where gigantic corals, certainly 20 and perhaps 40 feet high, flourished. The astonishing change brought about in the course of the ages exalts our conceptions of the wisdom and extent of the plans of the deity and leads us to anticipate future changes whenever those plans require. The sandstone in the valley contains fossils of numerous creatures. The deeper we dig, Hitchcock pointed out, the more unlike living animals and plants are those found in a fossil state leading to the conclusion that there have been several successive creations and extinctions of animals and plants in our globe before the production of its present organized beings. Anticipating what many readers were probably wondering, he asked, of what possible use in a moral point of view and in a revelation for the great mass of mankind would it have been to have given an account of the creation and extinction of certain huge ferns, seaweeds, etc., whose relics would be brought to light not till several thousand years afterwards by the researchers of geologists. He answered his own question. I find them a striking evidence of the benevolence of the deity. For a long time, he explained, the globe was evidently preparing for the residence of man and other animals that now inhabit it. Before their creation, its temperature was too high and its surface too liable to be broken up by volcanoes and drenched by deluges to be a secure and happy abode for the more perfect races of animals that now inhabit it. But it was adapted to the nature and habits of such animals and vegetables as we now find entombed in the rocks. It says how the vegetables that existed in those early periods have been converted in the course of time to the various species of coal now dug from the bowels of the earth while the remains of the animals of those times have become changed into limestone. And even those volcanic agencies by which the successive races of plants and animals have been destroyed 
have probably introduced into the upper part of the Earth's crust various metallic veins very important to human happiness. And in all this, we see indications of that same benevolent foresight and care for supplying the wants of his creatures to which our daily individual experience of God's goodness testifies. This remarkable passage, all the more so for its ostentation's presence in a scientific report to a state government, abundantly reveals Hitchcock's belief that the earth is a very special place, exquisitely prepared for us through vast geological ages by the creative power of God. We find nearly identical ideas today in Hugh Ross or in the pro-intelligent design book, The Privileged Planet, by astronomer Guillermo Gonzalez and philosopher Jay Richards. Almost done. Yet the creation was not only for us. Even though God ultimately intended the world to become the residence of intellectual and moral beings, prior to our appearance, he peopled the world with animals perfectly adapted to its condition, rather than leaving it desolate during those mighty periods of preparation, thus showing infinite benevolence. He went much further when introducing a book on the plurality of worlds by Cambridge scholar William Hewell to American readers. Is it not incredible, Hitchcock asked, that amid the countless bodies of the universe, a single globe only, and that a small one, should have reached the condition adapted to the residence of beings made in the image of God? Of what possible use to man are those numberless worlds, invisible, or vi excuse me, visible only through the most powerful telescopes? Surely such a view gives us a very narrow idea of the plans and purposes of Jehovah, and one not sustained, in our opinion, by the analogies of science. He went on speculatively to suggest that there may be races of intelligent beings upon other worlds where the condition of things is wildly different from that on Earth. Indeed, he says, were not angels, other rational creatures, more exalted than man, who, like him, have fallen from their first estate? Might there not be similar examples in other worlds? And is there not a probability that holy angels now in heaven may be rational intelligences who have passed a successful probation in other worlds? Despite his enthusiasm, then, for an ancient earth created on the installment plan, Hitchcock rejected evolution, both in pre-Darwinian and Darwinian versions. He was fully convinced that the bestowing of life must be regarded as the highest act of omnipotence, he said. Even more, the special creation of humans was crucial for his natural theology. Admit, if you choose, that all other events on the globe, even the creation of all other organic beings, might have been by ordinary laws. Yet, so long as the great fact of man's creation stands out so conspicuously in our world's history, we need nothing more to establish beyond cavil the reality of divine interposition in nature. He regarded the grandest miracle of nature as also the greatest of revelation, a lofty and immovable rock to arrest and beat back the waves of unbelief and to reflect the glories of divine power and wisdom. Countless subsequent Christians have believed the same thing, investing such tremendous theological and apologetic significance in the special creation of humans that they could not come to terms with Darwin without jettisoning almost everything they believed about God and the Bible. But that's another story, and as I'm sure you'll agree, this story is already long enough. 